Hello and welcome to another series of what will hopefully be educational and exciting. And I've got some very interesting positions and games lined up. And in these videos, we're going to be learning about a very important concept. And that concept is changing the tempo of the game. And we're going to look at some examples, five games in total for this mini series. And we're really going to concentrate on when top players change the tempo of the game. And we're going to try and show you how you can do that and bring that kind of uh, asset into your own play. Now, let me show you one of the most amazing chess games I've ever seen, just to whet your appetite a little bit. And this is a game that was actually Vishiwan Anand's favourite game of all time. So when he was asked, what's your, what's your favourite game, Anand? He said, this game here, was, which was actually played in Gibraltar roughly 10 years ago. The two players, we had a good friend of mine, Grandmaster Danny Gormali with the white pieces, and his opponent was uh, Satovsky, a very strong player from Israel. And he now came up with a fantastic combination. So let me just show you the end of this. And then for the premium members out there, we will go through the whole game and see how Black built up this amazing attack. Now, a very complex position. And the star piece here is actually the little bishop on a8. That hidden piece there is ready to cause havoc in the position. Just watch that guy. And in this position, Satoshi played pawn takes f3. Well, I do mention the bishop on a8, but this guy here, this pawn is the real hero. I think it was Philidorf who said the soul of chess is the pawn. This is like your foot soldier. Not really giving, you know, much glory in the game of chess, but it can be one of the most beautiful attacking units when it works well. And in this position, white played queen takes f5. And now look at this pawn go. It's a bit like, I don't know if you can remember the game Pac-Man, but you had to go along taking all those small little balls. Well, this pawn here is like Pac-Man. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. I'm, I'm not very good at doing the Pac-Man sounds, but you, you get my drift. Pawn takes G2 check, guarded by the bishop on A8. There's only one move here, king to G1. And here Satoshi came through with another check, bishop to D4 check. And look at those bishops. They're, they're like laser beams shooting down towards the white king. There's only one move here, queen to f2. And I'm not going to show you the move that forced resonations here. A little puzzle for you guys who are watching this. What can black play now? And after black's next move, even though black is number of pieces down, just count the pieces. Black is a queen and a rook down. After the next move, black forced resonation so can you see the move and what is one of the most amazing finishes in any game of chess than i have seen so now for the premium members out there let's have a look at this game and we're going to delve deeper into this topic of when you should change the tempo of the game of chess when you should speed up and go for glory so let's move all the way back to move one so Really, I mean, I was doing a bit of research myself into chess and how I became a grandmaster. And I thought that one of the areas in chess that a lot of people neglect in books and in videos is timing. Timing in chess is such a key, key thing. And lots of lower rated players seem to get their timing a little bit off. Their timing, they you know, they can't get their timing right. Now, let me give you some clues. In wild, crazy positions, as we're going to see here, you need to go, you need to be really alert. You can't mess about with slow maneuvers because in crazy positions, tactics and going for your opponent's king is the main thing you need to be concerned about. So there's no time to do slow maneuvers. So when you look at a position, when you're playing your own games, you need to always have this idea of timing and tempo. This is one of the real underlining keys to becoming a better chess player. You need to decide whether you have time to improve your pieces, whether you have time to do long maneuvers or if the position is com becoming urgent and you need to do something urgent i mean just imagine that you were i don't know caught up in um some kind of i don't know fire at your house you would maybe doing the cooking or something and, and a fire suddenly started well 
you, you wouldn't want to finish the cooking and just relax, you know, listen to the radio, listen to the end of your favorite show while the house is burning down. You want to get out of the building as quickly as possible. And you need to do this in chess. So we're, we're going to flip the board now and look at this from Satoshi's side. Uh, Satoshi was the hero of this game, we could say. And um, the thing was, this game started off reasonably calm with white playing e4 and now black playing c5, which is one of the most uh, aggressive ways of playing against e4. But it, it gets quite positional. This is the Sicilian defense. Danny now plays knight to f3, d6, and here we see d4, the so-called open Sicilian, which has a reputation of being a, a very aggressive attempt from white at getting uh, attacking position. Black takes on d4 and now develops with knight to f6, attacking the pawn on e4, knight to c3, and here, the most popular Sicilian, there's various moves can, black can do here, various variations of the Sicilian, but the move A6 is the so-called Nidal variation, favoured by world champions such as Gary Kasparov and before Gary Kasparov, the famous Bobby Fischer. Bishop C4 played, and when Bobby Fischer played as white, he also favoured this Bishop C4 move, pawn to E6, blunting that bishop out, Bishop b3, and now a typical idea in the knight off b5. And here, white simply castled. Both sides really just doing a bit of shadow boxing here. You can't do anything too crazy at the start of the game because you need to get all your troops into the battle. So this is where bishop e7 is played and black's getting ready to castle. And now white shows a little bit of aggression with queen to f3. Now, of course, one of the first rules you need to gauge in chess is when your opponent plays a move, you should really concentrate on their move and you have to consider what their idea is. So why did white move the queen to f3? Well, you should look at that piece and look where it's now pointing. It's not threatening to take your knight on f6 because we're captured a queen, but it is now nastily lined up against your rook. So if you are half asleep here and not paying attention to your opponent's ideas, and let's say you castled here, well, you'd actually get a lost position straight away because white can then play the strong move e5. And OK, white's going to win some material because he has two threats here against your knight and rook. So black now plays queen c7. The idea of this is to meet e5 with the counterattack bishop b7. And you can see the queen here is defending the bishop. So queen g3 played. And now black plays knight c6, trying to attack the center. And white decides to capture on c6 and play rook e1, guarding the pawn on e4. Taking on g7 is too dangerous here because black responds with rook g8. And after queen h6, just knight takes e4, gaining the pawn back. And you can probably see here there's horrible ideas against white's king, especially the g2 square. So rook e1 played. Both sides still developing, playing very sort of calm. So the pace has not intensified yet. Pawn to a3, rook to d8, and here white played a4. It might, see, might seem a bit strange going a3 and then a4, but white's idea is that the black rook on d8 is now misplaced. So white wants to move his rook into black's position. Black eventually castles, white captures on b5 and now we see him develop his last piece with a deadly threat bishop to h6 and this of course is threatening queen takes g7 checkmate black needs to stop that so he needs to defend the square on g7 knight to e8 and now the point of white's idea a4 and taking on b5 rook to a7 you can see that whites open up the line for that rook but this is kind of a little bit artificial, what White is doing here. He's moved his bishop here, and he's moved his rook here. It kind of reminds me of a, of a drunk boxer. You know, a drunk boxer throwing punches but not landing any punches because none of these moves are really creating any threats. They're not really doing much. They're kind of moves without a purpose. And one thing you could note when you're in this situation, if your opponent seems to be drifting a little bit with his moves, then 
it's maybe time to intensify the tempo. So what I mean by that, look at ways to attack. Because if your opponent is drifted, drifting with his moves, you can try to use that and try to pressurize him. So we're going to see Black now do that over the next couple of moves. Well, first of all, he goes Rook A8. You might as well just get rid of the two pieces in your half of the board, so the rook and the bishop. And what I mean by your half of the board is I'm going to do some lovely arrows here, covering up the board. Look at all those lovely arrows. Looks a bit like a prison bars there. Um, but white's pieces in that area of the board, which is really your area, black is now going to exchange off. So we do exchange off the bishops. And now bishop f4 knight to f6 and again everything looks very peaceful at the moment but now black starts to come forward so rather than throwing a big punch from black here he's going to accelerate the tempo little by little and he's doing this by bringing his pieces to more active squares watch the knight first the white piece comes back to h h6 now black decides okay i'm just going to go here because i want to prove who the boss is you're going to go back. I know you're going to offer me a draw because your opening hasn't really been a success. I've got at least an equal position here. But I'm happy to repeat the position once because now I can come forwards. B4. Just showing the opponent who the boss is. And this attacks the knight. And here we're starting to gain threat. So if your opponent is drifting, look for ways to create threats. Look for ways to improve your pieces. Look for ways to move forwards and that's what this move does white's knight now has to retreat and we force the knight to a passive square for the time being that knight on a2 is okay potentially coming to take that pawn but at the moment it's very passive knights on the edge will fall off and now black comes forwards knight to f6 He's creating a threat against e4, slowly intensifying the pressure, slowly creating threats, slowly activating the pieces. Uh, White now keeps up with his strategy of trying to get a draw with bishop h6, but now black can come forwards. Knight to h5, and I did say watch that knight. That knight is going to be a fantastic piece and look at just how the pace changes here it really is like from a runner going for a very slow pace to a jog and then a sprint because he's grasping the opportunities his opponent is handing him and again when you're doing this in your own games you've got to look out for the signs so you've got to look out for opportunities like when your opponent starts to drift opportunities when you can see threats that you can create but these all must be built on a strong foundation you can't build up threats if you haven't castled your king which you have here you can't build up threats if you haven't developed most of your pieces which you have here so you need to have the basics behind this surge in pace white now moves his queen to g4 the knight is on pre so black goes queen b5 defending the knight and also defending the pawn on b4. Now white here plays his first mistake, f3. Every pawn move you play in chess makes weaknesses, every single pawn move. And whenever you move a pawn, you have to be aware of what you are weakening. Now, what is the move f3 weakening? Well, have a look at these juicy dark squares. These juicy dark squares are now open towards the white king and this is going to be a key factor later on so you have to be very careful when you play pawn moves around your king because you're going to weaken it and that's exactly what we're going to see occurs here so try to guess black's moves as we go along black intensifies it little by little the first stage when you're trying to pick up the gear your your pace is to bring your pieces to better squares let's have a look at your pieces well the knight is is done a little bit of damage your queen is good so you need to look at your other pieces. The bishop now comes to f6. The bishop finds a much better diagonal and also giving extra protection to your king side. White plays rook b1 and he's a very horrible move to play because again, another piece goes passive here. The Look at these pieces of whites huddled over in the queen side but they're not really doing anything. Again, when you're looking at times to throw pieces at your opponent, start an attack. If you notice that your opponent's pieces are doing nothing 
and they're really passive that is when you the alarm bell should be ringing you should be thinking uh, 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 time to attack and that's exactly what black does here bishop d4 check taking control of that newly weakened diagonal king h1 and now a nice little tactic that can win a pawn can you see a way that black can win a pawn bishop takes b2 and the point of this is if a rook takes bishop you lose control of your back rank the black queen can swing down to f1 delivering checkmate so the rook on b1 has to control the f1 square this square here and bishop d2 is now played just retreating and now black comes back with his knight this knight just being very annoying queen g3 and now we've got to think of the next stage of this what do we do now well again we've done as much as we can with our queen our bishop and our knight so we need to open up our other pieces how can you try to get your bishop on a8 in the game and as i said before this strange looking piece hiding in the corner of the board is the deadliest sniper at the end of the game and now it's time for Derek the d pawn and just watch this guy go d5 here comes Derek. This little soldier is, is a big winner of this game. It's a great move, though, because you're trying to clear open some pawns for your bishop on a8. If you can get rid of, for example, white's pawn on e4, which I've highlighted, then the bishop has further range. If you can get rid of the white pawn on e4 and the white pawn on f3, it has even further range. So you're just trying to give your pieces the best range that you can. Bishop takes b4 played, so white trying to get some counterattack, and black now goes even quicker. So he sees here, black, Satovsky, that of course he can move the rook, but he picks it up another gear because he notices that this pawn, should we say the Derek pawn, can become an incredibly strong attacking unit. And he does some calculation, and he comes to the conclusion that he can go for pawn takes e4, sacrificing so... He's gone from jogging to running. And if you want to become a better chess player, one thing you have to do is pressurize your opponent as much as possible. Take some risks. Play dangerous. This is the best way to improve. Don't always play in a defensive way. The best way to improve is play in an aggressive way. And here, well, white plays a slight mistake, c4. This is a mistake because it improves the positioning of black's king. Black's queen can now come over to f5 and on f5 it's nearer to the goal which is white's king so we're bringing the big pieces over to pressurize our opponent's king white grabs the, the rook on f8 and there is a checkmate on g7 now so we now see the knight come over to h5 and in this position well white desperately tries to exchange off queens this is a good idea when your material up you should aim to exchange queens off this is one of the, the the sort of simplest rules you should remember in chess if your material down on the other side of that court coin you should try to keep pieces on the board to try to keep the complications going now there was a lovely idea let's just have a look at a, a possible variation here it looks like white might be able to play queen b8 i'm trying to come in on the back rank and now threaten a move with the bishop so if it's white's move here the bishop can move with checkmate. And one thing that we're going to look at in these videos is about this pace and the tempo. And calculation always comes into this. If you're going for maximum pace, which Black is doing here, by sacrificing, you need to keep the tempo up. So you need to keep the frets going. If you can't do a big move here and do start thinking what your play is Black, you've got to look for the checks. You've got to look for the captures. You've got to look for the crash bang wallop moves here because you don't have time to play defensively because white has deadly threats by moving this bishop and creating a checkmate against you so you don't have time so you've got to play with urgency here your house is on fire as we've said earlier on you've got to do something quickly did you spot the move knight g3 checkmate a fantastic counter-attack to now starts well a, a winning should we say a winning attack against the white king white can't go king g1 because if he does bishop d4 is actually checkmate and again look at that weakened diagonal black 
is hoping for something like queen takes g3 and the idea of black's knight maneuver by moving the knight away from f6 the bishop on b2 defends against checkmate so we have more time even though we've lost a piece we've gained more time and chess is often about gaining time even if you have to lose points and here well black's attack becomes pretty unstoppable after remember Derek the d pawn started here here comes Derek, and that pawn is going to win the game for example rook takes b2 and we take on g2 again the pac-man pawn gobbling everything that's path and after something like rook takes g2 the winning move is queen to f1 checkmate and this just shows you some of the dangers that white is facing and what is the winning piece here look at this beautiful bishop on a8 pinning that rook so that little sniper is such a pain for white now if we go back to the game the game continued queen g4 and now we see Derek doing the damage. A lot of Ds there. Did you like that? A bit, of, a bit of alliteration going on there. And here, pawn takes f3. Here comes Derek. Queen takes f5. Derek is on fire. Pawn takes g2 check. Go, Derek. Go, go, go. And the bishop defends that pawn. King to g1. And here, well, we use the other bishop. In these kind of positions, little tips to try to find the right moves. If you're going for this really intense attack, when you're really just going for your opponent's king, you've just got to look at all the moves that create threats, all the checks, all the captures. And here, bishop to d4 check is clearly the best move. It's not quite checkmate because of queen f2. And here, at the start of the video, I gave you the challenge of finding the winning move here. And the winning move is quite uh, astonishing move. Can you see the move? Knight to f4. And this is one of the most unbelievable positions I've seen in modern chess. Even though white is a queen and a rook up, even though black's last move was not a check or a capture, which are normally the forcing moves we're talking about, which when I say forcing moves, they force your opponent to do something in a check. They have to escape the check. In a capture, they have to deal with a capture. But here... There's nothing that white can do satisfactorily to, to stop knight to h3 checkmate. Let's say he wins another piece. Queen takes d4. Knight to h3 would be one of the most beautiful checkmates I think that's ever occurred in this game of kings. Look at that. And, well, in this position, Danny Gormati resigned. Other moves are not going to help him. If he tries moving the h-pawn to give his king an escape square well even here it's going to be terminal after something along the lines of either knight e2 check or knight to h3 check uh, in this position i'll let you uh, have a little think about how you'd finish this off uh, danny being a strong player realized it was hopeless so he resigned but uh, a fantastic game by satovsky and uh, what should we take away from this game well first of all you can't always force the pace in chess. We saw the opening, if we just go back to move 12 here, we saw the opening was actually quite calm. You can't always force the pace from the start. Even the calmness of positions can become crazy if the storm clouds are brewing. And that's exactly what happened here. But if your opponent starts to wander, as White did here, if we just look at some of White moves, he, he kind of started playing aimlessly with his bishop. His bishop went backwards and forwards. If you notice your opponent is playing without a plan, you should try to punish him. Build up the tempo. And then, if you're given the opportunity, always look at ways to bring your pieces to better squares. So look at how the knight and bishop come better on. They jump into the game here. There goes the knight. And later on, there goes the bishop as well. All the black pieces come into life and the key move, I think, that really started this attack was Derek the D-pawn. Look at Derek. Poor old Derek the D-pawn is not doing anything here. Oh, but he's got a hero's future. After we see Derek coming to D5. And this idea is to release the bishop on A8. And really, again, 
in chess, if you want to become a better player, you've got to grasp the opportunities to change the tempo, to punish your opponent, and really get to grips with when you need to play with more urgency. And I'm going to, I've got another four videos in this series, and hopefully by the end of it, you you will you will have a feeling to when you should look at the board that you're playing on. So when you're playing a game and when you need to play with more urgency. But I hope you enjoyed that video. A fantastic game. I think you're you're agreeing. And I'll have more videos on this coming to you very shortly.